Hey, Wonder Hussy here. Welcome to another edition of Lifestyles of the Not So Rich and Famous. <laughs> Back in December, I made a video walking up and down the length of the world famous Las Vegas Strip, home to some of the most beautiful and glamorous resorts in the world where every extravagant desire and wildest fantasy can be fulfilled with the right amount of money. Well, today I'm gonna give you a peek behind the curtain, a glimpse at the seedy underbelly of the beast, the inner workings of the machine that facilitates these fantasies and desires. That's right, today we're exploring the shadowy twin of the famous Las Vegas Strip, the yin to its yang, the id to its ego, industrial road. This is where what happens in Vegas really happens. The nitty gritty, not so pretty, behind the scenes nuts and bolts of what makes Vegas, Vegas. When you call a cab, go to a strip club, or order an escort from one of them little cards they hand out on the strip, odds are your request is fulfilled by the happy little elves right here in Santa's workshop, AKA Industrial Road. Geographically speaking, Industrial Road parallels Las Vegas Boulevard, AKA the Strip, running roughly north-south, literally in the shadow of its far more glamorous and far better known twin, just to the east. It starts downtown, just north of Charleston Boulevard, just inside the Las Vegas city limits, and then it continues south for 14 miles through Clark County. A lot of people don't realize that most of the world-famous Las Vegas Strip hotels aren't actually in the city of Las Vegas. Back when Bugsy Siegel first built the Flamingo in the 1940s, Huh. That was way out in the desert on the highway to Los Angeles. All the other casinos were downtown in and around Fremont Street. But over the last 80 or so years, the Las Vegas metropolitan area has metastasized to surround the Strip and beyond. So Industrial Road is literally a lifeline connecting old Vegas to the north to new Vegas to the south. And as you might expect, the farther south you get away from downtown, the less interesting it becomes. But we're gonna start our adventure right here at the north end of Industrial Road, near where it starts, at the Hard Hat Lounge. This unpretentious working man's bar has been here since 1958, although I guess originally it was a diner and it didn't start serving booze till 1962. But these days you can get food and drinks here and the prices are very reasonable. Forget about spending 15 bucks on a cocktail at one of them fancy strip hotels. This is the kind of dive bar I like. You know what I mean? It's a real working man's bar in a real working man's neighborhood. I mean, for cripe's sake, we're right next to the friggin' railroad tracks and, well, I'm not sure if we're on the right side or the wrong side, but whatever side it is, it's just people going about their business, trying to get by and make a living. Plumbing supply, construction, cannabis, sewing machines, bed spreads, and taxis. That's right, taxis. Back in the days before Uber, taxis and limousines were like the lifeline of Las Vegas, bringing the tourists from the family-friendly strip out to where the real action is. See, gaming control regulations don't allow strip clubs inside casino resorts, so most of the titty bars are lurking in the shadows just off Las Vegas Boulevard, far enough away to preserve the strip's pretentious airs, but close enough for an easy late night foray. And this right here was one of the most legendary strip clubs of all back in its day. The famous porn actress Jenna Jameson notoriously got her start here when she was supposedly just 16. And honestly, I don't doubt it. Uh, I actually used to work with a girl who grew up here and she said she also started stripping when she was 16. And uh, everything went fine until her algebra teacher showed up one night and got a lap dance and then reported her to the manager for being underage. Anyway, I can only imagine the wild shenanigans that went on behind these classy, gilded doors. Man, I would die to get in here. Can you imagine the layers of dust and cobwebs covering the stripper poles, the stages, the 
bars and the girls uh, locker room backstage oh seriously if anyone watching this has the authority to get me into this old strip club to make a video call me anyway this place has been closed for a while and well it's a long story involving drugs the mafia prostitution customers getting beat up and or killed and all kinds of bizarre and twisted connections uh i can't believe no one has made a movie or a reality show about this place it's a fascinating story i was doing some research on wikipedia and apparently well the place was under surveillance almost constantly by the FBI for suspected mob connections, I guess. Well, in one of their investigations, they even interviewed Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro about this place. Even weirder, I guess neighbors in this area had been trying to get this place shut down for years, even going so far as to build a church somewhere in this area. Uh, I guess there's some weird section in the Las Vegas Municipal Code that prohibits a strip club or a topless cabaret from operating within 1,500 feet of a church. So the neighbors figured, oh, that's how we'll get rid of them. We'll build a church right here in this neighborhood. The place ended up getting shut down a bunch of times, but up until fairly recently, it did open up once a month for eight hours just so it could retain its cabaret license. I guess a strip club license, a cabaret license is kind of hard to get. And so once you get one, well, you don't want to let it lapse. So as derelict and abandoned as this building looks, I guess it still opened up once a month for eight hours until 2019. Man, I wish I would have known about it. I totally would have come out a drink. Anyway, in addition to all the crazy mafia stuff and customer beatings, which by the way, I think there was like five or six different lawsuits against the security guards at this strip club for being overzealous. In fact, I think at least two patrons died of their injuries from the beatings they got by these strip club bouncers. Well, in addition to all of that, there was also a scandalous murder involving the next door neighbor here, uh, a guy that used to have an auto electric shop right here next to the strip club. Uh, his name was Buffalo Jim, and I guess he was constantly getting into arguments with the strip club owner over the parking spaces. They share the same uh, parking lot, and so they were always squabbling over parking spaces, and I think the strip club probably wanted to expand and they wanted to force him out and he didn't want to leave. Well, nobody knows exactly what happened, but what we do know is that Buffalo Jim ended up mysteriously dying of a drug overdose. And I don't think they ever conclusively figured out what happened. Uh, some say Buffalo Jim just had a meth habit and accidentally took too much one day and died. But some say the strip club owners may have had something to do with it. Okay, now here's something that's totally evocative of everything that's industrial road. Okay, so here we are in front of this crazy derelict old strip club, and I happen to look down and see a piece of photo paper laying on the ground. And I thought, oh gosh, what's this? It's gonna be a picture of some sexy stripper, right? Wrong! It's a picture of the crew at some Lowe's hardware store branch. And that's what I like about Industrial Road. They keep it real. Oh, look, here's another one. What's this, the Walmart night shift? Aw, no, look, they won some award at Lowe's. That's so cool. Aw, they must have got some kind of customer service awards. Good for them. I can't imagine how this ended up in front of the derelict Crazy Horse 2 strip club. But hopefully, wherever you are, you're doing well, and you have your certificate framed and hanging on your wall. Now, titties are all well and good, but sometimes a man wants to blow off some steam the old-fashioned way. And Industrial Road has your back there, too. See all this crazy stuff? I'll try to shoot through this chain-link fence so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, you might be able to see there's part of an airplane fuselage, a bunch of tanks, a truck, a bunch of military stuff whole bunch of tires. Well, I think it's actually a tactical training course that's part of this nearby gun range called Battlefield Vegas. And it's got like a side business called Gunship Helicopters, where you can actually book a flight in a helicopter and then shoot a machine gun from that helicopter. Okay, well, I guess Battlefield Vegas is sort of a shooting range and a well, military museum, because there's all these tanks and trucks and helicopters and stuff out front. 
But my understanding is you can actually recreate your favorite historical battle here. Okay, I guess they have period authentic weapons, and I don't know if they create like a virtual simulation, uh, but basically you get to pick your favorite battle in your favorite war and recreate it. So, oh, say you were too busy going to college or being a senator's son to go fight in Vietnam. Well, not to worry. For a low, low price, you can get the same experience right here in an afternoon and still have time for a mani-pedi massage and a steak dinner before your trip to the titty bar. And by the way, all of this is going down on the back end of Circus Circus. <laughs> Now, speaking of dinner and strip clubs, here's a place you can do both. <laughs> Sapphire. This used to be the old Las Vegas sporting house, gym, until it was turned into, well, they say it's the world's largest strip club, and I don't know if that's actually true, but I have been in there, and, well, it did feel really big and cavernous, and honestly, it didn't really feel very strip clubby, but uh, apparently, I think it, well, before COVID, I think it did pretty well, and it was considered one of the better places to go. And then what's really funny is they put in this organic, non-GMO Mexican restaurant right next door. You can't really see it because there's a tree hiding it, but you can kind of see that crazy skull face on it. But it is, it's actually an all organic, non-GMO Mexican restaurant, and it's really good. I've been there a few times and it's a lot of fun to take out of town visitors here because they always look so confused when you roll up to a strip club. I should note though that they are totally separate establishments. They're just under the same roof. Okay, now this strip mall here is pretty much the entire reason I'm making this video. As long as I've lived in Vegas, which is over 20 years, this strip mall always seemed like it was the creepy epicenter of the smut scene. But now it looks like the Seagull Development Group has bought it and they're probably gonna clean it up and well, who knows what they'll turn it into. But back in the day, it was kind of a one-stop shop for all things sexy time. Uh, first of all, there's this all nude strip club called the Can Can Room down at that end of the building. But then there was all these other related businesses here too, like a stripperware store and a uh, spa or a massage parlor, best in Las Vegas, and a, a liquor store. And then this, well, swingers club that I'm pretty sure wasn't really a swingers club. I think it was either a brothel in disguise or maybe a clip joint. What's a clip joint, you ask? Well, it's basically an establishment that uh, gives you the impression that it's a brothel. Uh, I guess the way it worked was like t a taxi driver would pick up a guy and, and be like, hey, Pally, you want to get lucky? Like he would never be explicit and say, do you want to get laid? Uh, that way he couldn't get arrested. But if the guy was like, hell yeah, I want to get lucky, then the driver would take him to one of these clip joints without ever actually saying it was a brothel. So then I guess the guy would go in and they would charge him some kind of exorbitant cover charge, like leading him on, making him think like, ooh, yeah, I'm gonna get some. So they like, okay, uh, yes, it'll be $50 and just to enter and they'll wait here in this room and you know, the ladies will come in or whatever. They'll just keep stringing him along and charging him more and more money. Like, oh, well, if you'd like to be more comfortable, perhaps you'd like to go into our back room. Uh -uh. So then that was like an extra hundred dollars. Whatever the case, eventually a woman would come out and take him into a room, but she had no intention of ever ha doing anything sexual with him, uh, is my understanding. Uh, she, she would just maybe charge him another hundred dollars if she wanted, if he wanted to get more intimate. So he'd give her another hundred and I mean, all she might end up doing is just like massaging his hand and giving him a glass of juice. And then if the guy tried to complain about it, well, the bouncers would just kick his ass out because what's he going to do? call the police and complain that he was trying to purchase illegal prostitution? No, no one's ever gonna say anything. So that's my understanding of how these places worked. And I'm pretty sure that the swingers club over here used to be one of them. But anyway, that's not even the most interesting thing about the shopping center, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, I think this used to be where all the alcohol promoters were based out of. Okay, that's the name for the business license you get if you're if you're running an escort agency in Vegas, you know, like those billboard trucks that drive up and down the strip that go, hot girls, direct to your room, or those little cards the guys hand you on the strip that have pictures of those various women who will come to your room for $99. Well, those are obviously escort agencies, but the official business license name is Outcall Promoter, whatever that means. 
And it's funny that there's even an actual business license for something that's obviously an illegal business. But I guess technically an alcohol promoter is just someone who sends a woman to dance in your hotel room. You know, not to have sex or anything like that. The $99 you're paying her isn't for sex, it's just to have her show up and share her company with you. Anything she does above and beyond that is on her and, well, I guess she can keep that money, but the $99 goes to the alcohol promoter. Anyway, one time I was writing an article or something and uh, so I was researching all the different people who had registered alcohol promoter business licenses and almost all their addresses traced back here to this building. So that made me think that either one guy owned all the escort agencies in Vegas, which is a possibility, or this is just kind of like the escort agency district. Okay, now just on the other side of that overpass is another really interesting building. Okay, so most of the building is taken up with Deja Vu Showgirls Titty Bar, and then there's like a Deja Vu Showgirls Sexy Lingerie Store. And then way down there on the north end, I think that used to be another clip joint. But at the far south end of the plaza, there's something I think is super interesting. In my opinion, this is one of the top museums in Las Vegas. Now, I know Las Vegas isn't really known as a museum town. Most people come here to shoot guns and look at titties and gamble and, well, not go to museums. But if you are one of them upscale muckety mucks who comes here for the restaurants and the shopping, well, you might already know about the Mob Museum and the Neon Sign Museum and the Atomic Testing Museum, all of which are super interesting world-class museums, except maybe the Neon Sign Museum. I feel like that place is kind of a rip-off. But you never hear anything about this place. Now, I know many of you would never dream of setting foot in an establishment called the Erotic Heritage Museum, but take it from me, this place is fantastic. It's really well thought out, well laid out, well lit, world-class museum dedicated not only to the history of pornography, but also to the history of First Amendment rights, okay? Uh, sure, there's Larry Flint's gold-plated wheelchair and plaster casts of all the famous porn stars' penises, but they also have a they have a recreation of an old-time peep show. They have a recreation of an old-time 1970s smut movie theater. And then they have like this whole display dedicated to uh, the political scandals involving all the various hypocritical, hypocritical politicians over the years. And then a whole display about the, well, about the freedom, the valiant pornographic industry freedom fighters and their First Amendment battles. And then there's a whole section of erotic fine art. It's actually really, really well done. It's super nice, it's super well executed, and it's super fascinating, and I can't recommend it enough. Check it out. They used to do naked yoga here, and I went to a few of those classes, and that was very interesting. Okay, so now we're definitely out of downtown, and we're coming up parallel with the fancy hotels on the Vegas Strip. So uh, Industrial Road does class up a little bit down here. There's no more strip clubs, there's no more clip joints, but there is one very interesting place right here. Well, actually, I'm not sure the restaurant is here anymore. There used to be a place called Diamond Chinese Restaurant that was like 24-hour Chinese food. It was friggin' delicious, and it happened to be uh, connected to this awesome old dive bar called Sunny's Saloon. This was definitely one of those old school Vegas places. I don't know how long it's been here, but my friends and I, well, I used to work at Caesar's Palace right over here. That's where I knew that gal that started stripping when she was 16. Anyway, uh, Caesar's Palace is just right over there. So we'd come out the back after work and come on over here and have some delicious Chinese food at like one in the morning and then go have a few drinks in the bar. Awesome place. Now, just because things are starting to class up along this part of Industrial Road above ground, doesn't mean the same thing is true below decks. Another really interesting thing on Industrial Road is right here in this wash, right here in the shadow of the Rio Hotel, there's an entrance to those underground storm drain tunnels where all the homeless people live. You've probably heard about it. Uh, there's basically miles of these concrete storm drain tunnels underneath the whole city of Las Vegas to help channel all the flash flood waters when we get these crazy summer thunderstorms so that the water doesn't just flood all the streets. Well, they, they dug out all these miles and miles of concrete tunnels that run all underneath the city and, well, a bunch of homeless people have set up camp 
in the tunnels. You know, it protects them from the blazing baking summer heat and the freezing cold winter winds. And well, you can look it up on YouTube. There's people who've gone down there and made videos. I think there's a, you know, documentaries about it, articles about it. And people have emailed me saying I should go down there and make a video, but man, I, I would totally go down there. I'm very curious, but I would feel exploitative uh, unless somebody who actually lived down there personally invited me to make a video. So if you happen to be watching this and you live down in this uh, one of these storm drain tunnels, call me or email me and let's set something up. But I did hear one super interesting tidbit about this particular entrance to the tunnels. Now, this part of the video is gonna be especially NSFW, not safe for work. So if you haven't already sent your kids out of the room, do so now. Okay, well, apparently the people who live down here call this particular entrance to the tunnel system, Celine's Pussy. Okay, I guess there's various access points to get into this tunnel network and well this particular entrance happens to be right across the street from caesar's palace and they have these big posters on the wall outside caesar's palace advertising the various headliners that are doing shows there you know what i mean like you can see that now usher is doing a show and morrissey is doing a show morrissey has a show at caesar's palace but anyway back in the day when celine dion was doing a show there was a i guess there was like a big poster of celine dion there and if you came into this entrance at a certain angle well it looked like you were walking into her crotch so the people who lived or hung out in these tunnels used to they'd say like okay meet me at Celine's pussy at six o'clock <laughs> okay maybe I'm just immature uh, well actually definitely I'm just immature but I don't know man I thought that was so funny when I heard that okay well I gotta get going because we have a few more stops to make and well the sun is setting fast and i sure don't want to get caught on industrial road after dark all joking aside though it's actually really sad that there's people who are so poor they have to basically live in the sewer under the bellagio okay now we're definitely out of the seedy and interesting part of industrial road and well you can see that gentrification has set in and it's all because of these douchey high rises which ruined everything, including the name of the street. I guess an awesomely unpretentious name like Industrial Road was good enough back in the nitty gritty days of the Mafia, but in 2005, the developer of this luxury high rise successfully lobbied the city to change the name of this part of Industrial Road. You know what I mean? Like, how are you gonna convince all them rich Californians to buy a place in a high rise on Industrial Road. So they convinced the city to change the name of this portion of Industrial Road to Dean Martin Drive. Bah. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the Rat Pack as much as anyone and I definitely think they should be remembered and honored as being a huge part of Vegas history, but come on. <laughs> and then to make matters worse, they actually renamed another portion of Industrial Road after Sammy Davis Jr. in 2015. But in true Vegas fashion, they only gave Sammy Davis a little tiny portion. I think the Dean Martin gets like 10 miles and Sammy Davis only gets 1.8. But as for the panorama towers and the posers who dwell within, joke's on them. You can take the industrial out of the street name, but no matter how much lipstick you put on it, you're still living in a pigsty. And I know from first-hand experience that for many years, there was a pornographic film studio right here in this building in the shadow of the beautiful Panorama Towers. Right in that back building, right there. How do I know this? Well, believe it or not, I actually worked as a background extra in a bunch of adult movies. I know, I know, I'll wait for you to stop laughing in disbelief. But it's true, there was this one porn production company that actually had scripts and plot lines for their movies that called for fully clothed background extras. You know, like one time I played a secretary, one time I play, played a bank teller, I played a jealous wife, a jealous girlfriend, a pregnant wife. I did a whole bunch of them for a while, about mm, four or five years ago, and it was really fascinating work. In fact, I should probably make an entire video all about that because it was so interesting and I don't have time to go into it in this video. But yeah, I saw at least two or three movies in that back building right there, right in the shadow 
of the super fancy panorama towers. Uh, incidentally, that porn production studio ended up moving to another part of town because it was too noisy here. Uh, I guess this is like right in the flight path of all the helicopters that uh, go to and from the Grand Canyon every day. And well, they got tired of having to cut and reshoot scenes because of chopper noise in the background. So they ended up moving way out somewhere in the suburbs. Anyway, this is pretty much the end of the interesting part of Industrial Road. I mean, as Dean Martin Drive, it does continue on another 10 miles south past the new Raiders Stadium and the Hustler Club and a farm and ranch feed store before it eventually dead ends at the farthest southern subdivision just west of I-15, Southern Highlands. But for all intents and purposes, Industrial Road, as I love it, basically ends right here around Tropicana Avenue, where there's one final seedy place of note. Okay, so the sun is going down behind the mountains back there and the light's really challenging, but right behind me here is the Wild Wild West Truck Stop Motel Casino. That's right, there's a, it's not a hotel, it's a motel casino, perfect for truckers. In fact, you could even say it's geared toward truckers. Uh, because it's got a big parking lot, it's just right off the interstate here, so they don't have to mess around driving around the city streets, they just pull right in. There's a big old lot where they can, well, park and sleep in their rig if they want, uh, and turn around and whatever, without having to deal with all the hustle and bustle and mess of Vegas. And consequently, well, there's also a lot of prostitutes in this area. Now, I think a lot of them are based out of that budget suites back there in the distance. I don't know if you can see that. It's one of those places that you can rent by the week or by the month, and it's Honestly, the perfect place for a prostitute to stay because, well, you're right across the street from this giant truck stop motel casino, but you're also close enough to the big hotels on the strip for uh, quick ins and outs. Don't be dirty, I was talking about burgers. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little peek at the real backbone of the Las Vegas economy because without all these fine establishments on Industrial Road, Vegas would be a pretty boring place. I mean, you can only see so many Cirque du Soleil shows before it gets old. So next time you're out here enjoying that $75 steak and that $15 gin and tonic, or just standing around in your Gucci loafers watching them fountains, remember that what happens in Vegas probably started out on Industrial Road. <laughs>